Everybody have copies of uh, I thought everybody have copies of uh, there were two outlines one of the uh, Book of Revelation and the other of Ezekiel 30, 39 if you're going to get one where, where are they uh, the extras located and all in the right there all in the back if you didn't get one okay. okay. Well, we've got a, got a little bit of ground to cover uh, today, uh, the whole book of Revelation, all of eschatology, and a few other things. <laughs> so, uh, we'll start with prayer. Uh, Lord, we thank Thee for Thy mercies to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby we have been redeemed from everlasting destruction and uh, brought into the glory and the blessedness uh, of Thy kingdom, which is the kingdom of the Holy Spirit and of our righteousness. And we thank thee then that we stand before thee as thy children who are free to call upon thee in the name of Jesus and know that our prayers are heard at thy throne of grace. Grant us this day thy grace, we pray thee, O Lord. And as we gather here for our last class, we thank thee for the opportunities we have had uh, to have fellowship in thy word through these uh, past weeks. And we pray that uh, the uh, things that uh, we have uh, gathered from thy word may uh, be such as will build ourselves up uh, personally in the faith but also which will uh, contribute uh, to the blessedness of the ministry which we will be given to perform in thy name as thou hast given us days of uh, preparation in thy good providence uh, so grant to us each one uh, days and, and years of uh, opportunity uh, to bear the testimony of Jesus uh, wherever we are placed. And uh, may thy church faithfully carry out this task to the ends of the earth. And so uh, hasten the uh, coming of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, our Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, which is our blessed hope. Be with us then uh, in our studies this day. And uh, may our thoughts be uh, true to the scriptures we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now what we want to do is to uh, try to round out and bring together our uh, discussion of millennialism uh, as a key part of the pattern of biblical eschatology. And in uh, handling that subject uh, so far in our dealing with, especially with the book of Daniel, chapters 2 and 7, we developed one major uh, argument in behalf of a non-millennialist over against either pre- or post-millennial views, which was to the effect then that there is a simple pattern of eschatology in the Bible where the church age leads up to the, the final judgment. And uh, that final judgment is uh, one of dual sanctions, which ends with the end of the world and the introduction of, of the kingdom of God. And uh, so the biblical picture is one where the Old Testament prophecies of the kingdom coming in power and glory uh, are not fulfilled until the great white throne and judgment, until the final judgment of them and, and the elimination of uh, the world power. And uh, which is to, to say then that uh, uh, both pre and, and, and post uh, our, our views are not able to handle this because uh, on, on either one of them, uh, the millennium, which on their view, of course, uh, precedes this consummation event, is the, the occasion when, as they see it, the, the kingdom comes in power and glory, whereas the biblical uh, evidence does not allow that and insists that that does not happen until after the final judgment which uh, is after the millennium so our, that, that was the one general type of argument we uh, uh, have pursued so far. Now today a uh, uh, second major overall type of argument we're presenting uh, has to do then well the different ways of describing the issue one it would be in terms of the, the book of Revelation as a piece of literature and in uh, the book of Revelation uh, we'll have a little time. We can't do as much with it as I would like to, to have done today. Uh, but uh, in, in the book of Revelation, there is, of course, a, a pattern of, of a recapitulation where the, the storyline keeps taking us uh, through the church age and, and up to a final crisis and, and indeed uh, a, a, a consummation event. And that final crisis, which appears repeatedly, uh, but among others, appears in chapter 16. As the, uh, <clears throat> as the Battle of Armageddon, to which the beast and the false prophet uh, gather together the whole um, uh, world to, to that particular conflict, that, that uh, the great day of the Battle of, of God Almighty, 
And uh, so chapter 16 describes that. And, and what I'm saying now, it would be uh, agreed upon by uh, pre-mills uh, and um, you know, <coughs> some preterists might uh, not be, but the, the pre-mills we're uh, thinking about right now would agree uh, that uh, this battle of uh, Armageddon then is the, also the one that's described toward the end of chapter 19 where the, uh, John sees the white horse going forth and, and the Lord Christ riding on him with all the armies of heaven proceeding. They go forth to this, obviously the same battle as was described in chapter 16 where the beast and the false prophet and all their armies are gathered together and destroys them so that this, this principle of, of recapitulation within the book of Revelation uh, is then recognized by the premills uh, too at that spot because after coming to the end of history there things have obviously backed up and then we come to that point again in, in chapter 19 and, and so here is uh, uh, Armageddon mm -hmm. here is the battle of, of Armageddon which is the occasion of Antichrist, which is the occasion then by way of response of the parousia. And that's chapter 16, and then you come to chapter 19, and ditto, once again, and, and this is the read-on interpretation on, on both sides of the discussion. You get it again in chapter 19. Now the question is, as you move from chapter 19 into chapter 20, uh, you know, do we proceed from the point that has been reached here, the Armageddon Parousia event, uh, to something that 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 uh, follows it, or do we once again, as we did between chapters 16 and 19 and uh, all kinds of other places, do we once again back up and then come back to that same point uh, as we, especially then as we uh, come after the Millennium Passage, to the Gog Magog episode. So the question then becomes, is Gog Magog a, a development subsequent to the Armageddon episode described in chapter 16 and just previously here in chapter 19? Uh, is it something subsequent to that or does it equal that? And of course my whole contention is that Armageddon equals Gog, Gog Magog equals Antichrist, Gog is Antichrist and so on. And if that is so, if Gog equals Armageddon equals Parousia, and of course in the 20th chapter, the, the millennium precedes Gog Magog. Gog Magog comes at the end of the millennium with the, the end. Of, if, if, if Gog equals Armageddon and the millennium is before Gog, then of course the millennium too uh, comes before the battle of Armageddon as described in chapter 16 or before uh, the, the same battle as described in chapter 19 and of course that would be the end of the whole premillennial scheme if the millennium comes before the uh, parousia and that in effect I think is what the pl scripture plainly teaches so that to show that uh, Armageddon another way of expressing it uh, you know Armageddon is the end of the millennium because Armageddon is, is God and if uh, Armageddon is the end of the millennium and the millennium must uh, be before Armageddon, before the parousia, then that is also the end of, of premillennialism. And uh, that was uh, pretty much the thesis then of the article, and I trust you all have access to this and, and will read it. I think uh, I haven't made out the final exam, but it will be to your advantage to have become familiar with the information in this article, Armageddon, and uh, the end of the millennium, which we will be trying to cover as much as we can in any case, uh, today was in, uh, in JET's Journal of Evangelical Theological Society in uh, June 1996. I trust copies of it are available for photocopying copying in, in the, the library. So this is the, the thesis now. At the Gog episode, the end of the uh, millennium of Revelation 20 equals Armageddon, uh, uh, the, just before the parousia event of Revelation 16 and, and uh, 19. And as I say that, thesis then would mark the, the end of premillennialism because it would put the parousia after the millennium rather than before it. And as far as, uh, as uh, postmillennialism is concerned, it uh, wouldn't lend uh, any uh, comfort to that view either because 
Uh, you are just multiplying passages that portray a great crisis that's going to o overwhelm the church at the end of the uh, ch church age and just before our Lord returns and to the extent then that you can demonstrate that, uh, from scripture that to the extent that scripture reveals that that particular uh, crisis uh, which uh, precedes the parousia is one of global proportions in which the, the church's witness is uh, pretty much a, a silence uh, to the extent that you do that of course you contradict the whole concept of post-millennialism everything moving uh, in, in a development where the, the church's influence and dominance in the world increases until uh, as uh, David Chilton for example in his commentary on the book of Revelation uh, says that, that uh, all of the nations of the world shall become uh, a part of this uh, theocratic uh, in enforcement of uh, a Christian uh, rule in uh, uh, the world. Now, that, that view is just uh, uh, totally, totally contrary to to the, the nature of, of this uh, episode that closes uh, uh, the, the present uh, church age. So th these are the things that we have in, in mind as applications of our our exegesis. Now, the first point then, in demonstrating that between chapter 19 and 20 in the book of Revelation, that we do not move sequentially forward, but that once again, as we've done repeatedly in the book of Revelation, uh, we move back from the end of history where we were in that Armageddon episode of chapter 19. We move back of that, and we, we read about the uh, the binding of Satan and a thousand years during which he is bound and, and uh, which is the present church age leading up then uh, to uh, this uh, God may God episode that contention that we have recapitulation here fits in of course perfectly as I've been saying with the structure of the whole book this is not something novel in the book of Revelation or elsewhere in scripture for that matter it's not something novel in the book of Revelation rather repeatedly that is what happens. We keep coming to the end of history as we move uh, through uh, the, this thing. And at this point, then, maybe just to quickly uh, suggest or fill out that, that, that thesis, uh, if you can find the apocalypse outline that was distributed. And uh, let's, let's just follow along in, in there for a moment. Now, what we uh, want to do in terms of, of this uh, outline uh, is uh, to establish that uh, within each of these uh, sections, uh, the A, B, C, D is a chiastic arrangement, A, B, C, D, C, C B, A, within each of these uh, uh, sections and uh, also within uh, sort of the, the inter, if you look at the outline, you'll see that each major section there, especially B, C, D, C, B, uh, has a prelude and uh, then the vision proper, and uh, then an interlude. The interlude in several cases uh, comes you know, within the vision proper, separating the about the sixth from the, the, the seventh vision. They're, they all seem to be divided into seven parts. And the interlude may come between the sixth and the seventh visions, or it may come after the end of the seventh and be an interlude between that vision and, and uh, the next one. And what I'm saying now is uh, that repeatedly within the vision proper, we come to the, the end of history, and uh, also uh, within the interlude uh, sections, even there, they, there's a, a parenthetical backing up and, and taking us forward. So that's what we want to suggest, and uh, uh, all told then, there are places as we move to the book of Revelation that describe the present church age. And then there are places that describe this crisis, this uh, Armageddon <coughs> Antichrist uh, crisis, the response to which is then the parousia. So that, that is the, the crisis, then the transition from uh, this world history to the consummation, and so the eternal kingdom is the third uh, uh, section. So it can be demonstrated that repeatedly we move from here to here to here, and then no place to go but back. The most obvious illustration is, look, by the time you come to the end of chapter 11, uh, you have uh, moved through the whole history to the end of the world, and then you come to chapter 12, 
and uh, uh, that's the episode of the, the woman bringing forth the man child. We're back at the incarnation again, and then we proceed uh, again through the church uh, age. Now, just a few other illustrations, and, and if there should be any time, we can come back and try to flesh out the, uh, the, this a little further, our treatment of the book of Revelation. But, uh, for example, in uh, the uh, in, in section A, the seven um, letters uh, under the heading Church in the World, huh? The Church in the World, chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation, the uh, letters uh, sent by the Lord to the seven lampstand uh, churches. Uh, within that, you, you have a description, of, well, lots of description of the present church age, and in particular, uh, in, in the concept of tribulation is one that I want to be emphasizing. The nature of this church age, you see, uh, as one which is characterized uh, by the, the double concept of martyr, martyr as witness, martyr as sufferer, uh, the fulfilling of the Great Commission is what's going on here, and the fulfilling of the Great Commission involves the church in the suffering of the Great Tribulation, and to, so that's what the nature of, of this period is, and uh, illustrative uh, of it then is something like uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, uh, speaking of the character of the age, uh, and um, a, a, a suggestion perhaps of a crisis, and in, incidentally the the, the relative <coughs> length of these periods is this is a relatively long period, various indications of that. It is the three and a half times, by the way, of course, that we have seen elsewhere. And then the, this uh, crisis uh, is a relatively short period, hmm? precipitating the final uh, judgment. And uh, uh, one indication of a, perhaps a relatively mm -hmm. short uh, but severe crisis in, in the seven letters is in chapter 3, verse 10, which speaks about an hour of trial uh, that perhaps the uh, particular ones might be ex exempted from. And uh, then in terms of the picture of eternity, each of the seven letters uh, ends with the promise to the overcomers. Mm -hmm. And if you just piece together uh, all of those promises to the overcomers, you have a, a, essentially a delineation of, of the picture of of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem uh, that, that you get full-blown at, at the end of uh, the book. And so the, uh, the seven letters themselves move you through each of these periods and, and uh, end up with the thought of the, the, the ultimate uh, blessedness and triumph of, of uh, those who have suffered for their testimony. Meanwhile, moving on into the seven-sealed book and the judgments of the seven-sealed uh, book on, on the world uh, after the sixth seal is opened uh, we have a picture in chapter 6 verses 9 uh, excuse me the fifth seal it would be the fifth seal uh, chapter uh, 6 verses 9 through 11 the first four seals of course introduce the four horsemen of the apocalypse who go, go gathering forth into the world and, and there's a general description of what things are like in this uh, world, uh, but then uh, what in particular is the experience of God's people? Well, the opening of the fifth seal uh, takes us uh, from the lower register to the upper register, and we see the souls uh, of, uh, of the saints who have suffered up there in uh, heaven, and uh, they are praying the imprecatory psalms uh, here, which we were lecturing the other day in the penitent class on the question of intrusion ethics, and we were noting that the kind of ethics we call intrusion ethics that mark final judgment, that marked uh, uh, Israel's conquest of Canaan and so on uh, down here on earth, uh, and, but which do not belong to the contemporary scene when, when the, the, the saints are bearing their evangelizing the, the nations. Uh, but nevertheless, even during this present stage, in terms of the church triumphant, the in intermediate state, they too are already engaged in imprecatory <laughs> psalms and in, in and final judgment uh, uh, ethics. And, and here is a place where we see that in chapter 6, verses 12 to 17, uh, where the saints are with the Lord and are praying, and they, they are given assurance that they will be resting there and, and, and so forth. And so there's a, a, a comforting picture for the benefit of the martyrs of, of their condition when they are uh, with the Lord and... Uh, and uh, resting and reigning with, with him. And then when the seventh seal is opened, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, somewhat mysterious, uh, it says that there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. And uh, 
Uh, we won't get in, try to discuss all the possibilities there, but I, th I think that is suggestive of the of the eternal state. Within uh, the seven sealed uh, books, we have then an interlude, as you see, and uh, chapter seven, verses one through seventeen. And uh, within that, uh, there is another little uh, section where we find ourselves at the end of history. So uh, we have we keep moving. To the, in, in each block of material, and the, the end of history is, you may note in chapter 7, verse 9, and verses 14 through 17, which describes this great multitude that is before the throne, and, uh, and uh, they are defined as uh, those who have been redeemed out of the world and have come out of the great tribulation, and there they are, the, the, those who have come from all the nations of the world. So the gospel has been gone out to all the world, the great commission has been carried out, and the fruit of this is a great company of those uh, who, who stand before the throne. They have come out of the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. And they are now at the point of, of uh, being in, in the presence of God. Moving on to the uh, judgments of the seven trumpets on the, the world and the, the great city. Um, chapter 8, 2 through 11. I would suggest uh, that when we come to Trumpets 5 and 6, a uh, 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 point like this, I commend you to the commentaries and so on, but as I see it, uh, the, the fifth and sixth trumpets have taken us up to this crisis. Mm. And uh, more clearly, the seventh trumpet takes us to the end of history. In fact, before the seventh uh, trumpet sounds, back in chapter 10, verse 7, it's, uh, we are told that with the sounding of the, the uh, uh, seventh trumpet uh, that we have come to the, to the end of, ends of things, chapter 10, uh, verse uh, uh, 7. Uh, there will be no more delay, but in the days, in the days when uh, the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced uh, to his servants uh, the prophets. And as you read what happens, uh, as a matter of fact, in chapter 11, when the seventh trumpet is uh, uh, sounded, uh, you will see that uh, that indeed uh, is, the, is the, the case. Uh, for example, in chapter 11, uh, verse 18, uh, we read that the, the, nations, the nations were angry. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. This is a clearly Psalm 2 type of background. Why did the nations conspire against the Lord and against his anointed? Well, he's going to then destroy them. And uh, so here we get that same picture of God's wrath against the rebellious nations of the world. The nations were angry. They, they gather, and this is Armageddon. This is that gathering thing. Okay? And, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead. <clears throat> and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and, and so on. And so clearly we are at the, the end of the world and the final judgment and the resurrection at uh, that point. Uh, it, if we had more time, I would be trying to put my finger on more places along the way that contradict the, the, the preterist approach of someone like, again, mentioned David Chilton a moment ago, but in his, his, uh, in his commentary... Uh, on uh, the, the cause of the days of vengeance, his commentary on Revelation, uh, repeatedly uh, he is uh, uh, trying to you know, give a preterist uh, a, a, a long since fulfilled in, in interpretation uh, to various episodes that, that I think plainly mark uh, the, the crisis of the end of, of the age. That, that's, that's the whole preterist strategy it is to eliminate or minimize uh, every indication that this church age ends in such a crisis, as we said earlier, that's a complete, uh, completely incompatible with uh, their more optimistic view of the way things are going to develop. Now they can't do anything about the, the Gog Magog episode that comes at the end of millennium, and you can't move it away from there because that's where it is—the end of the, the millennium. Uh, but just about every other place where you plainly have that same episode being described, the great day of the, the battle of the Lord. Then, then they uh, want to get rid of as much evidence as possible uh, that would be contradictory to their view, so they interpret it uh, of, uh, of something else. And so at this point, which is clearly describing the anger of God against the nations of uh, the world, they want to make this 
something that refers to 70 AD, uh, not, not the future, but something that happened long ago, and, and the anger of the nations that's being spoken of, and that clearly is anger against the Messiah and against the, uh, the, the Creator, uh, they see as the anger of the nations against Israel. Hmm? And uh, yeah, yeah, the, 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 uh, this is not what is going on here. The time for the final judgment and the resurrection and, and, and the, the dead and so on. Uh, this did not happen in 70 AD, but it's, it's uh, a part of the, 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 the desperation of, of the, the post-millennialists here to try to uh, make the evidence uh, fit the, their thesis. Uh, but uh, the, clearly this, this then is another place where we have come to the, the, the crisis and, and to the end of, of the world on, under Trumpet 7. And uh, also within the interlude section, if you look at the, that, it covers chapters 10, 1 through 11, 13. Uh, that's a particularly uh, helpful, important uh, section of the book of Revelation uh, by way of illustration of this whole pattern. And uh, this is the, the passage then that includes chapter 11, uh, the uh, s uh, setting forth of the church under the symbolism of the two witness, the two prophetic witness uh, figures. And so there they are, and, and uh, they are empowered to do their thing, to fulfill the great mission, uh, great, great commission. And we, we get the, the picture of they do it for three and a half times. So we tie that in with everything we know about the three and a half times. It's the second half of the 70th week of Daniel from 70 AD to the end of the age. That's the period then during which these two prophet figures are functioning. It's the whole church age. Uh, chapter 11, verse uh, 3 and, uh, and uh, following. And uh, then, however, at the end of uh, that three and a half years during which God has protected them, now we read about the kind of development that keeps occurring in, in this brief crisis section. It's uh, the emergence uh, of the beast. It's the emergence of, of Satan in chapter 20. Uh, the, the emergence of those who have been held under so that the church could do its thing in terms of fulfilling the Great Commission during the whole church age. These things have been suppressed. But now, well, Satan is unbound at the end of the thousand years. Here, the, the, the beast who has uh, also been uh, suppressed during th this time uh, now he comes up from the abyss. And so that's the way he is described. The beast comes up from the abyss and he kills the two prophet figures. And so the testimony of the church is, is uh, silence. And uh, that, that clearly is at the end of the, the church age. And uh, this then the, the bodies of, uh, of the two prophets lie there dead for three and a half days. All right, Relatively long period of testimony, three and a half years severe but relatively short period of crisis, their bodies lie there for three and a half days, and then the voice from heaven come up hither, there is the resurrection scene, the, the, the antichrist crisis is over, the beast from the abyss has come up and done his thing, and, uh, but uh, now there is parousia, now there is a r resurrection in, uh, uh, at that uh, point. I'm going to sail along and not handle questions for a little while, if you don't mind. Uh, moving on quickly now, the, the next section is uh, the, uh, the centerpiece, and as we said here, when you come to chapter 12, you know, it, it's so clear, we've been at the end of the, the world, and uh, uh, now we're dealing with the incarnation. So that, that's the way the thing keeps moving all the way through, through. You just can't assume that because one chapter follows another, that it follows it sequentially in terms of, of uh, time, it obviously uh, and, and does uh, not do that. Well, I don't know how many, maybe I should hold off and, and come back if, if time uh, allows for more of these, uh, in, um, or, or at least try to do this perhaps more, more quickly. In, in, in that central section that we, I call the War of the Ages, uh, you again have the, have the uh, time note of the three and a half years to, to describe the period in which the church, pursued by the dragon and the beast, uh, the church finds her place in, in, in the wilderness, uh, another indication of the nature of the present church age experience, uh, not a la post-millennial triumphalism, uh, but the church in the wilderness, uh, hard beset by uh, the foe, though protected, uh, though so protected as to be able to fulfill the Great Commission, nevertheless uh, very much uh, opposed by, uh, by the enemy. And. Um, 
All right, and uh, the end of history uh, is uh, we come upon at the close of that section, uh, the War of the Ages in uh, verses uh, uh, four, chapter 14, verses 14 through 20, is uh, that uh, scene of the dual harvest, huh? where the Son of Man gathers the elect into the heavenly uh, kingdom, and then there is the second gathering uh, of the wicked into the wine press uh, of God to, to be trampled underfoot in, in his wrath. So this section uh, brings us to that point. And once again, within the interlude, I won't go into that right now, but the, the uh, chapter 14, 1 through 13, if you will look through that, would have an interlude section. Uh, one, just one note in particular in that connection, uh, because of its uh, its uh, parallelism actually to the, the thousand year experience of the saints, which is one of describing them in the intermediate age. And back here in, in this uh, interlude uh, section, chapter 14, verse 13, we also have a picture of the, the intermediate state and the blessedness, huh? the blessedness of the Christian dead whose works follow the, the, them uh, hereafter. And uh, so that's that's uh, something in that section. And the the seven uh, bowls of wrath, the seven vials of wrath. Once again, it's with the trumpets, and there are all kinds of parallels between the seven trumpets and the seven uh, vials in the chiastic structure. They are the corresponding members. And uh, as in the case of the trumpets, the fifth and the sixth trumpets. So I think the the, the fifth and the sixth vials of of, of wrath uh, also is definitely bring us down to the end of history, and most definitely in chapter 16, uh, verses 14 and, and 16, that is the Armageddon. Huh? That's the one place then where we, we read about uh, uh, Armageddon uh, and the gathering of uh, all of the uh, armies together. Now the occasion, the, the battle, the gathering is mentioned repeatedly. This is the one place where it is uh, labeled uh, by the term uh, Armageddon and uh, Satan uh, gathers the nations to war there uh, against uh, the Lord and, and his people and in uh, chapter 16 verse 17 at the opening of the seventh uh, bowl uh, there is the, the, the formula it is finished it is done the his history is, is completed the judgment is over and we're at the uh, at the end of uh, the world again um the particular pattern of, of, of history divided into these three sections is developed, and, and we did this the other day, so it's not necessary to re repeat it here, when we were trying to uh, relate the little horn of Daniel 7 to the beast of Revelation. Uh, we t turned to the book of Revelation and saw how the, the history of that beast is one in terms of which five heads of his seven heads were passed. And there was the sixth head that now was, and the seventh head was then going to come up, which was, was also at the same time an, an eighth. And uh, uh, along with that pattern, the, the experience of the five heads was described in terms of the, of the title, he, here is the one who was. And then the, the, what was represented by the, the sixth and seventh heads, this is the beast who is not. And then the, the final crisis that was going to come, the seventh, eighth, this is the uh, uh, the beast uh, uh, who is to come. Hmm? The, chapter 11, it was the beast that comes up out of the abyss. In chapter 20, it's Satan comes up fr from his place of Im imprisonment. And uh, so in, in this uh, uh, counterfeit of God's name that, that is taken on by the beast, he was, he is that, and he is to come. He is to come up out of the abyss, but not to triumph, but to descend back in, in, into uh, uh, um, per perdition. And so once again, uh, the, the whole history of, of the church age and, and, uh, and uh, leading up to that final crisis is, uh, is developed for us in uh, this section. And so then that brings us to the, the, the final section, of the final judgments on the world. And that brings us right to the context we're especially talking about here of chapters 19 and, and 20. And... Uh, of course, our thesis is that what we've just seen happen, happening repeatedly happens again. And so chapter 19 and chapter 16 have taken us up to this crisis. And uh, so does uh, chapter 
uh, the 20, when we uh, look at it, it describes this uh, old church age as the, the millennium. And then Satan is that deuce at the end of it, and he comes up, and there is this this crisis, this uh, Armageddon uh, crisis. Only now it's described in alternate terms of Gog and Magog, but it is the same one. And uh, that's followed then by the final judgment, and so on. We'll be coming back uh, to that. But uh, so that that's the first major point we are trying then to develop the way in which the whole structure of the, of the book of Revelation exhibits the pattern which we are saying is uh, found in particular between chapters 19 and, and, uh, and uh, uh, 20. Now then, the, the next, the next uh, step within uh, the, the development of the whole thought is to try to show uh, that the, the Armageddon of uh, Revelation 16 and 19. Well, then let's put it another way. In chapter 19 and in chapter 20, here's the Antichrist. And here is God. Antichrist at the end of the church age. Gog at the end of the millennium. We're going to be demonstrating the millennium that is the church age because Antichrist is Gog. And the way we're going to try to demonstrate then that, that Gog is Antichrist is to try to show that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the common root of both. Now it's all along recognized by everyone that, that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the root of Gog and Magog because that's what you're reading about in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is Gog and, and Magog. And so there's no uh, uh, missing the chapter 20 is, is that episode. I'm particularly interested then in showing that, that in chapter 19 and chapter 16 before that also uh, are, are rooted in, uh, in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So the way we want to do that then, uh, more specifically, is to uh, show then that uh, Armageddon First thing we want to show then is that uh, uh, the what Armageddon is uh, and uh, our contention is that that is uh, then the, the is uh, the etymology of uh, Armageddon he is uh, a harmoid. And then after we have uh, demonstrated that, we will then take the evidence about what harmoid is. <laughs> And, uh, and and develop that, and so this whole line of thought will be providing us with something, uh, other things that are the equivalent of, of Armageddon, and we'll be showing then that, that uh, Harmoid is uh, explained by another expression, the Yark. The, the Archite Saphon, the Archite Saphon is uh, the equivalent of Harmoed, or Harmoed is the equivalent of, of the Archite Saphon, which we will be indicating means of the heights of Saphon, the mountain of the gods. And then, by reason of that connection, we also then discover uh, the, that Zion comes into the picture because the Archite Saphon equals Mount Zion. But now we come to the precise point. The Arctes of Bone is the place God comes from. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Armageddon equals Harmoed, the mountain of assembly. Mountain of assembly equals the Arctes of Bone, which is the, the heights of the mountain of the gods. The Arctes of Bone is identifiable with Zion and in Ezekiel 38 and 39 uh, uh, with, with Gog. And uh, therefore Gog equals Armageddon, that that's, that's, our, that's where the argument goes, all right? So now to try to fill out 
the, the evidence for that, the first thing then to be demonstrated uh, uh, is the etymology of Armageddon equaling Armoe, and that's where this uh, uh, article then uh, comes into the picture. Pause that refreshes here. <coughs> Um, I guess the best thing to do maybe for me is to just read some of this. Uh, so uh, Armageddon, the end of the millennium, and the first uh, thing that I try to demonstrate is, is uh, this particular uh, thesis. This is a view that was presented by the scholar C.C. Torrey uh, over 60 years ago and hasn't received much attention. I think uh, however it is right and I tried to provide some additional evidence to that which which uh, he brought forth you know commonly if you ask uh, someone or maybe your own thinking what is Armageddon you are going to be relating it to Megiddo hmm? and so Armageddon is the Mount of Megiddo unfortunately there is no Mount of Megiddo the place is a plain and uh, so that was one problem that Tory had in, in view uh, also he uh, mentioned the fact that consistently when the end of history is described, the great conflict where the, the world gathers together against the, the Lord, uh, the site is, uh, you know, uh, I, I would call it prophetic idiom or you would call it symbolism or whatever, but the site is Jerusalem. Hmm? The, the site is Jerusalem, uh, not the valley of the, the, the mountain, uh, non-existent mountain of, of uh, Megiddo. So that was his contention. And uh, and the etymology then, in, in, instead of seeing it as related to Megiddo, uh, he uh, adopted the view that it's uh, to be identified with Har Moed. Now, Har means mountain, and of course uh, in, in uh, uh, Har Megiddo you, you have uh, the, the Har at the beginning there. And uh, so it's just a question of which mountain. Has, so what we have to, to demonstrate is the equivalence of Megiddo with Moed. And uh, no problem really with this, although they might not at first blush seem to be exactly the same term. Uh, here you have the, the gamma in, in Greek, and here you have the I in, in, in Hebrew, but that's a normal equivalence. That's a normal equivalence of, of uh, Greek gamma for Hebrew I in, as for example in uh, the name of the city in Gaza, in, in Hebrew with an I in Gaza, but when transliterated into, into Greek with, with a gamma. So that. That, that's a normal equivalence, and, and the own a, a ending is, an, uh, is a very common uh, nominal ending that's tacked on to various words in, 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 in Hebrew. And so the, there's, the, the, there's no problem whatsoever with the, the transcription uh, of uh, Moed into, uh, into uh, Megiddo. That's uh, perfectly uh, valid. And, uh, okay, that's page... 208. Now, supporting supporting the equivalence of, of Armageddon and uh, uh, Harmoid. Each of these words appears once in the Bible. Armageddon appears in Revelation 16, 16. And uh, Harmoid uh, appears in Isaiah 14, 13. Now, that's a very interesting context, Isaiah 14, 13. It's, a, it's an antichrist uh, uh, context. And it describes the king of Babylon and, and his uh, antichrist type aspirations that make us uh, think at once of Second Thessalonians uh, 2 and the man of sin who exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped and so on. And uh, the, the kind of thing that we've seen throughout the whole history of the world with uh, the a divine kingship ideology that keeps popping up all over the place in anticipation of the final antichrist uh, who, who, who does it. Well, the king of Babylon is uh, portrayed in uh, such uh, uh, terms. Uh, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Stars are uh, one of the ways in which the, the members of the heavenly council are, are designated. Uh, this includes in the Canaanite text where they have their perverse version of the heavenly council and the members of it are called stars and uh, that, that, that formal use of the word stars fits here. He, he goes on in his, his, uh, his aspirations. I will sit enthroned on the Har Moed. All right, now here's our word. He's talking about the fact that his throne is going to be up there on the mountain of God at the top of everything in top God. And uh, 
So he says, I will sit enthroned on the Har Moed, the Mount of Assembly. Uh, uh, Moed it, it comes from the verb Ya'ad, which means to, to gather. And uh, Moed can be used for appointed times or appointed places, uh, uh, specifically of assembly, you see. <coughs> and, uh, so this is uh, where he's going to sit. On uh, the Har Moed, and now in apposition here in uh, chapter 14, verse 13, in apposition with Har Moed, which is the equivalent of Armageddon, in opposition with Harmo A, he says, I will sit enthroned on the Yakte Zaphon. Hmm? So here is a, another term for that same upper register reality, Harmo A, Yakte Zaphon are in opposition with one another, and the Yakte Zaphon, the Yakte referring to the extreme ends, of whether it's high or low, the heights or the depths. Hmm? And uh, here it's the heights. And we'll discuss more about uh, Zaphon in, in, in a minute. But uh, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. Once again, in biblical uh, imagery, the association of the heavenly theophany with the, the clouds. And I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like El Elyon, like uh, the Most High. Uh, that, that's what he thought. That, that's his aspiration. Now we get God's response to, to him. Oh, you, you thought you were going to go to the Yark de Zaphon. Uh -uh, you're going to go to the Yark de Bor, the extreme again, but it's the uh, upper extreme. It, it's the, the lower extreme of the pit, uh, the Bor. But you are brought down to the grave, to the Yark de Bor, to the depths of the pit. And uh, the, that, that will be... Uh, the, the outcome then of, of this Antichrist. But now what we're getting then is the equivalency of these terms, uh, all of them terms representing the mountain of God, the mountain of the deity, where the deity dwells, uh, as, uh, the heights of the thing. Now, in Isaiah 14, uh, 3, the one place then where we read about the uh, our Moed, uh, we see that it is the, the opposite, there is an antipodal opposite, total polar opposite between uh, the Har Moed, which is the, the heights of Zaphon, and Hell, which is uh, the, the Arc de Bor. So we are talking about the vertical axis of the cosmos here. And Har Moed, the Arc de Zaphon, mark the, the top of the vertical axis, heaven. And uh, the, the opposite of it is uh, the Arc de Bor. Now, likewise, in the one place in the book of Revelation where you have the name Armageddon, within the book of Revelation, uh, the, it is set in opposition also to uh, the pit. Correspondingly, in the book of Revelation, Armageddon, chapter 16, 16, is contrastively paired with Abaddon. Abaddon, another Hebrew term. Here, the name of the angel of the abyss, and in its Old Testament appearances, a synonym for Sheol, and uh, so uh, we, we get this interesting fact that each of these terms, uh, once appearing, uh, appears uh, as the, the opposite of, of something that uh, describes hell. So that also then uh, argues uh, for the point we're trying uh, uh, to make. Now one further, one further uh, argument I introduced then in this uh, article to try to support the uh, understanding uh, of um, Armageddon uh, as meaning the Mount of Gathering. Hmm? Now that's our contention. Uh, Armageddon me means the Mount of the assembly, of the gathering together, the, the Lord's hosts. But then, you know, there are all sorts of plays on the idea. It's where God gathers his counsel together. It's also the place where Antichrist gathers all of the hordes of the world together to attack. But then it's also the place where the Lord gathers his, his saints, who are his army, who destroys. But gathering, that's, that's, that's the, the, the theme that, then, that we want to support as uh, connected with the idea of Armageddon. And uh, an argument in favor of that is the labeling of the word Armageddon in the book of Revelation by the term Hebraisti. Hebraisti describing something as either Hebrew or Aramaic. 
There's another overlooked clue to the meaning of Armageddon in Revelation 16, 16 itself. What is the time on that one? 12.10. 12.10, thank you. Um, as noted in the discussion of the relationship between Armageddon and <coughs> Abaddon, each of those terms is identified as Hebraisti. Now our clue has to do with a stylistic feature characterizing the appearance of such transliterated words in the Greek text of the New Testament. So here are various Hebrew words, and not just Ar Ar Armageddon, uh, and not just Harmoed, that got that transliterated, but there are other Hebrew words that get transliterated in, in uh, the New Testament. And what we're wanting to call attention to is the particular way in, in which when this happens, uh, the, the term is labeled as, here's a Hebrew term, you see, it's transliterated into Greek, but actually it's a, a, a Hebrew term, all right? So our clue has to do with this stylistic. These words are regularly accompanied by an explanation of some sort. So you take a Hebrew word, you translate it into the, uh, transliterate it into the Greek text, and then you give an explanation for your audience's sake. Uh, sometimes even a translation of, of the thing is provided. For example, the Abaddon counterpart to Armageddon in Revelation 9 11 is a good example, which says they had a king over them, the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and who has in Greek the name Apollyon Destroyer. So you get an interpretation, an explanation of, of the transliterated Hebrew term. <clears throat> now, by way of further illustration, it will suffice uh, to mention those instances where the transliterated word is specifically identified as Hebraisti. These turn out to be all the more apropos in that this use of Hebraisti is an exclusively Johannine trait within the New Testament. <clears throat> And uh, with four instances in John's Gospel, <coughs> besides the two here in, in the book of Revelation. <coughs> in three of the cases in the Gospel, the word in question is the name of a place. In each of the <coughs> cases, the context furnishes at least an identification of the place thus denoted, if not a translation. And I go through those, and I won't take time to, to do them. Now, this, this consistent uh, pattern, then, where when you transliterate a Hebrew word in, in, into your Greek text, that you provide some ex explanation for it, and just don't leave your, your audience uh, in, in the dark. Uh, this consistent uh, pattern creates a strong presumption that an accompanying explanation will be found there in Revelation 16, 16, when Armageddon is, is uh, taken over as uh, Armageddon. And... Um, the, the place name there with the, the Hebraistic label. Such an explanation can be shown to be present once it is recognized that Harmageddon is based on Harmoed. The semantic connection, the semantic connection between Megiddon and the main verb in the statement is the, the thing to call attention to. It's as plain as you know, as you could want it to be as soon as you're aware that that's the meaning we're after here, the Mount of Assembly, and then you read the text. And he gathered him, huh? he gathered uh, them, Sonega again, he, he, he gathered them into the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. The verb sunago interpretively echoes the noun Megiddon. He gathered them to the Mount of Gathering. In effect, it translates Megiddon, establishing its derivation as from Moed, the Hebrew meaning uh, gathering. Sonago is indeed the verb used in the Septuagint to render the verb Ya'ad, uh, appoint the Nifal, assembled by appointment, which is the root of, of Moed, an appointed time or place of, an, uh, of assembly, etc. But that, that's uh, uh, the, the particular extra clue, but I think it's quite decisive. As soon as you see it, it becomes obvious that the text itself is telling you uh, what Armageddon means. He gathered them together. Clearly, that means gathering. Well, let's see uh, much uh, more of uh, this. Now, the next point, then, in our discussion would uh, be, as I said, to uh, trace this harmoid with which Armageddon can be identified to its equivalency with Yakte Safon, and then to develop the identity of Yakte Safon as a name for both Zion, but most especially as the name of the place with which Gog is uh, particularly I identified. Now, let's uh, see, maybe the, the first of those things we can do, in effect, we have al al already uh, uh, done it. Uh, the equivalency of uh, Harmoed 
equivalency of armo re of we already established we, when we looked at Isaiah uh, 14 and we saw that these two terms were in opposition there uh, the the Antichrist Babylon king figure aspired to enthrone himself on the Armo A, which was on the Arc de Saphon. So that equivalency is uh, is uh, established uh, uh, there. I deal with that. Uh, okay, now having done that, now we're interested in the meaning of Zaphon. What is this Zaphon, the heights of Zaphon? And of course we're dealing with uh, the idea that uh, uh, it's the mountain of God, huh? the, the, the place of God's uh, counsel and so on. And that's precisely what uh, Zaphon is also. Zaphon, the realm of deity, is the heading of, of this section. In texts from Ugarit on the north Syrian coast, Zaphon is the name of a mountain about 30 miles north of Ugarit that was uh, regarded as the residence of Baal, so that in the Canaanite mythology they have their equivalents and and their, their Zion is uh, Zaphon, uh, Olympus. Mm. Uh, and as a localized representation of the cosmic abode of the gods, Mount Zaphon shared its designation with the celestial realm. In the Old Testament, Zaphon means north, uh, as a point <coughs> of the compass named after a particular geographical features uh, here and, and there as you orient yourself various directions. And so Zaphon was to the north. and so it becomes a, a designation for uh, at north and, and uh, all right. Uh, but it may also denote Zaphon, the terrestrial mountain up there, or Zaphon, the mythological realm of the gods, or as a demythologized figure uh, in the Bible, the, the, the Zaphon designates the heaven of the Lord God, or the holy mountain of God, Zion, as the visible earthly projection of God's heaven. So uh, both in the true and in the false, the, the Zaphon can indicate either the heavenly reality itself or its earthly uh, uh, replica. The phrase, the Arctic Zaphon, appears in Psalm 48, verse uh, 2, Isaiah 14, 13, as we've seen, and in Ezekiel. So here are the points we're now developing. That the Arctic Zaphon, which equals Harmo A, is uh, dealt with in Psalm 48, and it becomes a description of Mount Zion, the earthly reproduction of uh, the heavenly uh, divine council. And in uh, Ezekiel 38 and so on, we will see that the Arc de Zaphon is uh, the place of uh, God's provenance. Oh. Its meaning is clearly seen in Isaiah 14, where it stands in opposition with the phrase uh, 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 that refers to the heavens to the, which the king of Babylon aspires. And, uh, okay, uh, that's... Um, have a, a lot further discussion about that term, Zaphon, <coughs> the gist of which I have already indicated. Now, let's see. Let's take a very uh, honest five minutes, no more, because we need all the time we've got. <laughs>